since this talk, and I haven't done a talk in, uh, well, I did recently did one for Vevolution last week, which was an awesome event, if you guys have ever heard of it. Um, the last talk I did was five years ago, and I used to work for Whole Foods Market. And so I used to help cater and run the Conscious Academy for, what did it, for Conscious Leadership. So John Mackey had written a book about Conscious Leadership. And he, being vegan himself, kind of empowered me to help them that company with a lot of the vegan options that they have. The talk before this was on squirrels, so I'm a huge fan of squirrels. This is my squirrel back in Portland. Her oh, name is Zelda. I used to set up uh, containers and she would come over and I'd put little coffee cups out and put nuts in them and we'd have a little photo shoot. She enjoyed that a lot. I enjoyed it. Just so you know, there'll be some uh, animals going throughout the presentation a little bit. So briefly starting out, when I was younger, like just to, to give you a heads up, this will be a, the story about how I even got to this country and how I'm working for Tesco. A lot of people want to know that, that story, so hopefully this resonates with you guys as far as how I developed and turned vegan and went and devote my life to creating foods that are applicable to meat eaters. I'm not, I'm going to tell you, I'm not trying to make vegans more vegan. I want to get people who are eating meat to eat more plants. All right, so I started out after high school, I went into lobster fishing, and I did that for four seasons, and that was probably some of the best and hardest work I've ever done. The gentleman I fished for was an amazing, amazing guy, and he was a great role model, and I enjoyed learning and doing that, that hard work at the time. He was very, uh, very conscious about sustainability and the whole system. That kind of, and this was off the coast of Maine, and on Bar Harbor, if you guys have ever heard of that. From there, I knew that I was good at cooking and I didn't go to university. I'm not one of those guys who has an MBA like the woman that was speaking about squirrels. Damn, she was smart. <laughs> like, I just can't understand half the words she was saying. So, I uh, practiced. Instead of learning scholarly things, I practiced tricks of the trade. Like, I had a job at one point at a ski resort for four winters. And all I would do was, we worked, I worked at top of the mountain, so I got to ski to work every day. I got really good skiing. Free. And I got to make soups every single day. And I got really, really good at practicing how to chop onions, like literally to the point where I could blindfold myself and chop 50 pounds of onions in like five minutes, which was pretty cool <laughs> for me. So I practiced and practiced, and my whole theory was if I could nail the basics, everything else would come. And it kind of proved right for me. At the age of 27, 28, I started my first restaurant. I had got a couple clients at a restaurant that I was in. I was making $10 an hour as a sous chef at the time and said, screw it, I'm just going to go on my own. So I started a little home catering service, personal chef service, and that blew out of control where I, I had that company for seven years. It was called Mahalo's. And back in the day, we didn't have cell phones like we do now. Like these things weren't even there. I am old, I'm like 83. So, um, but what happened was, I started this whole online business, which was in the e-coast. So in New Hampshire, there's no income tax there. So a lot of people would set up business. And what they did was turn the Pease Air Force Base into a corporation air, airfield. So I just happened to set up right next to the airfield. And I got all the business for the airlines. So everybody flying in, I started catering for everybody. This was not vegan, by the way. Like, everything I'm doing was centered around meat and centered around making people feel good about what they bought and just anything I wanted to do. And my main concern was for me to be successful. And I wanted to feed people and get paid for it. And I wanted to be the best at what I was doing. So I practiced that. I had no conscience as far as what I was serving, what I was doing. I can't say, I don't know how to say it. Like I, 
I want to apologize for a lot of the stuff I did before, but I did it unknowingly, just like most people do. I was in a couple really cool publications as far as restaurant startup and how to get an online business going, where you could order online and then come pick it up at the store, or I would deliver it. And this was 15 years ago, before they're doing it. Now here it's a thing. You should have cashed in somehow. Um, some of the magazines we were in, some of the stuff I would be doing, obviously not proud of the, the meat stuff, but I set up three different companies. One was called Mahalo's, another one was called the, the 100 Club, and the 100 Club was you paid an initiation fee and then paid a, a yearly fee. So it was like a golf club without the golf. And we stored wines and cigars and it was really fancy and we did like seven to nine courses and it was super, super expensive. I, I was only about the food and I, I ended up selling that to my partners because they were more into the business part of it and I just wanted to focus on the food. So after that, I ended up selling a, selling two of them. Oh, that was a cool thing. <laughs> um, I, I ended up selling two of them and realized, like, I was the shit at the time. I was literally, like, full of myself. I had so much success at the time. Mm -hmm. I was catering for some, the governor, and I catered for President Bush back then, and Whoever was anybody, like we were the top guys, Kate, and the coast and the sea coast of New Hampshire. I've, I ended up burning out a little bit, so I sold those two restaurants and started a farm. I wanted to know more about everything I was cooking, all the ingredients that I had and was working with. So I started a farm, and I literally wrote it to five acres. Uh, of this property and grew everything I possibly could. If you guys have ever heard of the Nearings, Scott and Helen Nearing, back in the 20s and 30s, they started a homesteading um, place in Stowe, Vermont, and then they, again, they did it in Maine, where they just took the ground and it was vegan organic. And this is where I started the whole path into, into more conscious, compassionate living. My brother has been vegan all his life, my brother Chad. He started a restaurant called Saf that was here in England, yeah. recently closed. So he was the guy behind that. And I, I'm his older brother, although he looks older than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so this is one of the shots I got from the farm that we were doing, and he helped me get this all started. And this is where we started working together. So this is 2003, I think. Um, and we started working together, and we were really interested in each other's techniques. So he was always a raw food chef, and I was just a regular chef. I made fun of him because a lot of his food was very hippie-ish to me. It wasn't mainstream. It's not something I would have ever done. It wasn't going to make a lot of money. It was new, very much new. And I wasn't into the whole nutritional yeast, which I can't make fun of him. <laughs> call it hippie fish food. Um, but we got, we're brothers, so we got along great, you know, and we just made fun of each other and learned from each other. He had never cooked meat in the day a day in his life, and I definitely never did raw food. So I have to change my slides a little bit so they're not so uh, hardcore. There's some really hardcore photos in here from the last presentation, but that one wasn't being filmed, so I have to adjust. So I met a wonderful, wonderful person who. Amanda was her name, and we got engaged. And we've been together for, we were together for three years. And that kind of changed my life, where she was such an amazing person and believed in everything I did and was, saw something in me that I didn't see. And she helped me change a little bit, soften up a little bit, because I was hard ass. And all I wanted to do was work and sell food and make money and be successful. What happened was, one, in the summer of 2007, we were to be married in a few months, but she was killed in a car accident. And so when that happened, my life changed immediately. I didn't know why I worked anymore. Like, all that ego and everything I was working towards had no meaning anymore. So I used to cater for uh, the Browns, who, the Da Vinci Code, Angels and Demons. Um, you guys have heard of this thing. So they lived in my town. And they were my one of my better clients. 
and they had all kinds of symbols and Buddhas around their house, if you can imagine the guy has, if you've ever seen any of the Da Vinci Code, you know this guy's personality. So he pointed up to this place in upstate New York, the Tibetan Buddhist monastery, and I went there, and I ended up living there for three years. I gave everything up, and I stayed there, and I learned everything about Tibetan Buddhism that I possibly could for these teachers. At the time, because of it, it was all ego-based and what I was doing in the past, I didn't know what the future was going to be like. I didn't even want to live it, to be honest with you. I had no need to be. What I learned there was how to help other people and how to cook for others because based on nutrition and what people need to live, not people, not what they actually want, per se. I was super lucky, so that on the, on the, the left, your left, they, so in Tibetan Buddhism, there's four lineages. When China invaded Tibet, and everybody escaped, the 100,000 Tibetans that got, that got to get, get out, um, the Dalai Lama called for all the lineages to be held with one with him. So the two teachers that I ended up living with and being their personal chef for two years, held that lineage. I didn't know how special this was until afterwards, much after, because I was too focused on what I was trying to heal. So I ended up starting the whole farm on their property, on the, in the monastery, and being their personal chef, and literally traveling wherever they went, and cooking for everybody they went to. I've slept in storage, con storage containers or storage rooms in different monasteries, just so I could get up and cook for 150 monks that were on a three-year retreat. I could have cooked for the Karmapa. It was really, really an honor um, to do this and dedicate my life to that for three different for three years. From there, my brother got a job at Whole Foods from SAF. He came over back over to the States and started working at Whole Foods. He ended up sending my resume around and wanted me to come out and come back into the real world with what I had been already learning. Thought I could help make a difference. So I ended up getting a position and we ended up on the same team and we ended up running and heading up the whole healthy eating initiative for Whole Foods Market in the States back in 2009, started. So it was called Health Starts Here. I know there's only a few Whole Foods here in the States, they're obviously a lot bigger. So during, before that though, in the farm is when we kind of developed our brand now, which is called Look at Healthy. And to me, that is just plant-based, period. But it's making plants sexy and craveable to the mass audience, to the mainstream, is how we're going to do it. Oops, sorry. <laughs> so, with all the knowledge with the, if you guys have ever seen What the Health, or Forks Over Knives, uh -huh. So all those doctors, Chad and I worked with those doctors closely. Like we were appointed a board of doctors and it was all of those guys. And that was when we said Dr. Esselstyn, Dr. Clever, Dr. Stoll, <coughs> Dr. Furman, Dr. Greger. Like all these guys, we got to work with them through countless immersions and learn how to prepare foods that were no oil, low sodium, low sugar, um, that could heal it. They were literally based on healing. They weren't based, based on maintaining. So we went from, I went from one extreme to the, to the total other extreme. And what Wicked Healthy is, is we bring that back to the middle. So, I guess I know how to do no salt, no sugar, no, no oil cooking. But I also believe that that's not very palatable for the mainstream people. Because if you're way overweight and you're going to die of a heart attack, then it's awesome to be on this certain diet to get all healed up and fixed. But if you're just running, like me, just active and doing whatever, you kind of want to eat food that's satisfying, comforting, and familiar, and similar. So this is Mildred. This is my, when people ask me who, who's waiting for me back home, this is my little lady back home. <laughs> so I worked for Whole Foods for six years. Ended up as their global executive chef for the company. So, 
leaving the, the healthy eating part and just took on the whole role of all the chefs and the recipe development for the on national program. What I did was work with suppliers. I worked and catered all the leadership events for the company. There were 62, I think I counted in six years, ranging from 30 people to 1,400 people. And I flipped the paradigm of every event. So, meaning every event that I catered was at a different hotel. It was always for leadership teams or for leadership of the company or these conscious academy events that they did. And I would work with the hotel chefs and instead of doing all meat dinners and then having a vegan op option, everything was vegan except there were two meat options. It was the opposite. It was the way that I feel hotels and mainstream companies, corporations should function. And I got to do that because the food was so good. Over and over again, they asked us to come back. And it made sense because everybody was happy. Instead of a bunch of people who wanted to eat healthy and had nothing to eat, or you know, when I say eat healthy, I mean eat vegan to me. Um, it flipped it. So everybody was happy. And if people who wanted to eat meat, yes, it was there. And nobody was going to bitch and complain. So I left Whole Foods. They wanted me to, I moved, I lived in Austin for five years. Sorry, I'm tripping around. I lived in Austin for five years, then I moved to Portland, Oregon, where I've been the last three years, except for when I moved to the UK recently. And I left Whole Foods because they wanted me to move back to Austin. I used, at the time, for six years, I traveled and was only home eight days a month. I felt that I wanted to live wherever I wanted to live if I'm going to travel that much. So Portland, Oregon was where I wanted to be. For one, there's a lot of squirrels there. There's no squirrels in the desert, sorry, in Austin. <laughs> so, Mildred had a brother, Hank, but he kind of, he has a couple pictures of Hank maybe afterwards, but uh, Mildred's, Hank took off when I, I worked at the, I don't know if you guys know about fostering animals, so I had him in the house, they grew up in the house, they know me as their dad, um, and then I slowly released Mildred, where, you know, taking her cage out every day, leaving it out overnight, and all of a sudden taking the house that was in her cage, putting it in the tree right outside the house where she lives now. Um, so now I can literally go outside and call her and she comes to me, which is freaking amazing. Um, I, the guy, so when I moved over here, I had a friend of mine take over my lease and um, he sends me pictures and videos of her every week. So I get updates and I'm waiting to go home and see her. So what happened from there is that uh, I had a year off. That during that year, I learned how to bake bread. Uh, so I remember from a really famous baker chef who worked for Thomas Keller in the United States. He's a uh, pretty famous chef. There. And he taught me how to make one loaf of bread, and which I could make pizza with. That's all I needed to do. So I practiced that. He said he would teach me those skills as long as I did it every single day for 30 days. And I did it every day for 30 days. And then I took that knowledge and I went and did a sound, a third, another 30 day silent retreat at the monastery this past year, um, which I've done five and a half of them, so I've almost been silent for six months total out of the last ten years, which some people are really happy about those six months and some people need to do that. <laughs> Along with the the baking bread, I, put, I picked up a camera and started photography. That's where I get all these cool pictures of Mildred could practice with her. So one of the other things I also did was partner up with Veganuary. So Wicked Healthy and Veganuary recently partnered up. And what I did was, I wonder if this is going to, this will work. So, if I go So there's no music here, but you can see what I'm doing. Facebook and began race as well. I spent five days and shot 37 60 second recipe videos that will launch 31 of them in the month of January, every day of the month of January to support people who want to cook craveable, sexy, crazy food with free from animals. I'm pretty 
pretty excited about that because it was a sh ton of work for five days. Um, this is my kitchen. I live up in Welling Garden City, which is a nice quiet town for me. I can come into London when I need it. Um, but Beginnerware is a really great organization. These are the guys who introduced me to Animal Aid as, as well to, to come and speak here. So with them, the January, I had met them previous, and then I came over and I so Tesco. This is probably the part everybody wants to know because this is the this is in the country. Right? So they had called me looking for a chef, uh, product development chef, and I said, look, if you really want to set yourself apart and be a differentiator, I'll come and be your chef, but I'm, I want to focus on plant based. Like that's the future. That's where it's more than a trend. Like I know how important it is. In my every big part of my being knows how important this is and how we can get it out there. And I can help any company do that if they're willing. And Tesco is more than willing. I really appreciate and, and respect the CEO team there now. It's been the last two or three years. The guy's amazing. He's doing all these really cool initiatives. I hadn't lived in this country. I didn't know a lot about Tesco. I only knew Whole Foods. So when they called me up, I didn't know. They're like, do you know about Tesco? I'm like, no. You know, oh, well, but you know, we're kind of a big company. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> I didn't, so I looked it up. I'm like, holy shit, a little big. So the resources behind what I can do there are immense. It's awesome. To be able to influence all these people is pretty awesome. And this is Buddy. So Buddy came to me the first day I moved into my house in that top picture. And I was like, shit, man. I went from baby squirrels to foxes, but this fox he didn't look too healthy at all. So I immediately got on. Uh, I'm like, all right, what am I going to do with this guy? He was my only friend at the time, uh, and he wasn't doing so well. So I got on the internet and started Googling what was wrong with foxes around here, and found out there's mange. So I got some mange treatment. I went to the stores, started feeding them, and giving them warming pills and like anything I could do without having to call the animal rescue because they said they were, if they come and got him, he would become back. So I didn't really like that response. So Buddy was coming around every day. And now he comes around like once every couple weeks. And whenever he does, if you guys follow Wicked Healthy on Instagram, I post it always in the stories and talk about him. He's like the biggest thing. He's way bigger than any food that I make. Um, <laughs> because he's such a handsome little devil. And he'll get a couple of feet from me and comes around in the day and he's such a sweet, sweet fox. Like he sits outside my door and waits for me. The neighbors started noticing what was going on. So then now they're feeding him when I'm not home. And it's been odd the past couple of weeks because of this daylight savings time. It's dark by the time I get home from work so I don't get to see him as much. But the neighbors report that he's coming around and sleeping in the yard and they still feed him, which is just like warms my heart. So one of the things that I'm kind of known for is mushrooms. I find that mushrooms are the biggest opportunity we have as far as all natural meat alternatives. I don't want to say replacement because I don't think it is a replacement for anything. But this is a, these mushrooms, I can achieve some freaking crazy things with them. And not people think I'm always on mushrooms, but I'm not. I, mean, I, I am, but they're this kind of mushrooms. So just to give you an idea, like I've partnered up with a lot of the growers in the country. And so these are just beautiful, beautiful mushrooms that we don't even sell in stores around here. Like some I see at Borough Market or a specialty market here and there. Um, but they're freaking amazing. So we got brown oyster mushrooms, yellow oyster mushrooms, pink oyster mushrooms here. Some of my favorite. I got a couple pictures of the book. So we have a cookbook coming out. It's called Wicked Healthy Cookbook. And it comes out here in the UK in May. And there's a lot of these things that will be in here. So I know it might be an alarming shot. But again, I'm not going for the vegans. I want the meat eaters to look at this and think what the hell they're doing. And be like, take, do a double take. Like, I feel that chefs have the responsibility to change everything, and we can change everything, but in first I have to influence them on an ego level 
It has to be done that way. So some of the things I can achieve with mushrooms is making things that look familiar to people and taste familiar to people. So this is a shredded mushroom. Everything I try to do looks like something I would have made a long time ago. It's just vegan now. But I don't scream that word vegan. I don't like it. I use the word free from animals. Um, vegan comes with a lot of negative connotations around certain circles. When I was at Whole Foods, so you guys know, I've only been vegan for a year, a little over a year, because of the last job I had. If I would have said I was vegan, they wouldn't have hired me in that position. And I saw how they didn't listen to my brother because he was vegan. So I cho we chose that I would not say I was vegan. So I worked with meat teams, seafood teams, and the only way I could influence them was by being like them. So at home I would cook plant-based, but out I would hang out and drink beer and do whatever anybody was doing at the time. And that got me into factories. That got me into all the shit that I don't ever want to see again, and I know why I'm on this path doing this. I went to tons of, you know, I've seen a lot of things I don't want to see anymore. But it also fuels what I want to do now and what I'm doing. Okay, let's go a little slow. So everything that we do, my brother and I, is definitely based on being creative and just take it's food. When people say, "Oh, hey, you gotta try this vegan food," no, no, it's freaking food. <laughs> hey, Derek's a vegan chef. No, 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 I'm a fucking chef. <laughs> Not a vegan chef. Sorry. So Frank's and beans back home. This is mushrooms. I'm just going to show a bunch of different pictures here of food to get everybody hungry. Um, there's my brother blurred out some of the fried fare. So this I call, uh, you know, when I was a kid, my mom would make me eat liver and onions, and that was disgusting. Um, this is not disgusting, but I call it off of liver and onions, and I make a this beet be blood au jus. And this is lion's mane mushrooms. So lion's mane mushrooms is also one of the only mushrooms known to help with um, dementia and Alzheimer. And I wish I could forget half the shit I know, but um, this is a really great dish. And just to show you how we're trying to appeal to people, it's new. It's more mainstream. I'm, I'm not into the. There's nothing wrong with the acacia bowls and the porridge, really pretty with the chia seeds all around and flowers but it's not turning anybody vegan, as far as I'm concerned. The way we're going to reach the masses is by making it craveable to the 95% of people out there, not the 5% of us that are out there. That's a mushroom. It's a maitake mushroom. And that's just me making fun of the way we used to play things in the 80s. <laughs> that's be a ribeye back in the day. Um, with your three asparagus, which is freaking ridiculous. But this is all vegetables, and I like this is one of my favorite pictures. And we recently did this two-way mirror thing where we did a customer survey, and these big companies do all these customer surveys where I'm like, why are you doing that? I already know it. You know? And they're like, oh, we got to figure it out for ourselves. So I'm like, okay. And some guy, he was a heavy meat eater because it was just like mixed mixed company, and he's like, that's what is that? That's easy. I could do that. I do that all the time. I'm like. I almost wanted to jump through the window and crush them. Yes. I'm like, dude, do you even know what that is? I know it looks like a piece of steak, but that's exactly what I want you to think. And it's not. <laughs> so this is the cross cut of that steak, and how I've been, no, I don't want to say manipulating, but how I've been, how I've created techniques in order to cook mushrooms to create a marbling effect that emulates what people want out of meat. So mushrooms are super resilient, their amazing textures can be formed and I try not to use that word manipulated, but it's just there. I can we can recreate them to be amazing and infuse flavor that I've never seen anybody else do before. So it's one of our our niches. This is another one with the potato, scalloped potato, we got lion's mane mushroom there. But I make it look this way on purpose. A lot of hardcore vegans don't like this. <laughs> I get it, but I'm not trying to make you guys more vegan. <laughs> we're, we are, we're already there. I want to influence the hoity-toity um, chef types. I want them to see how creative it is. So 
So the next one, if it counts. Sorry, there's no something there. So we even taking pictures of frying them so they're like fried chicken sandwiches and doing like whole things like this. So this is maitake mushrooms. Um, here they have a lot of oyster mushrooms. They, have, they do have some maitakes and some this and that. This is my version of ribs. So growing up in Austin, not growing up, but living there for five years, I definitely, there's a lot, it's a huge barbecue. So how else do I get the guys eating barbecue but by making things that look exactly like it that will fill that need. And if they discover in their head and say, oh shit, this guy's doing something way cool, they'll do it too. And it's working. It is working. I mean, I got hired by the third largest retailer in the world, so it's working somehow. Um, so again, another example would be, I mean, Seth Hayes. Orangue mushrooms, king oyster mushrooms. It looks like anything I would have served back in the day at Christmas parties serving on a, on a stick. So this is what keeps me awake at night, is thinking about food. <laughs> and thinking about how I'm gonna do things to appeal. And I don't wanna say pull, pull the wool over anybody's eyes. I just wanna experience, I want them to experience where, it come, where how to come at cooking from a compassionate point of view, except you can still be super creative, if not more so. Sushi. Maitake mushrooms cut in a certain way, marinated in a particular way with seaweeds and, and different uh, mirins and sakes. And, but if you guys have ever had sushi, this is, would be a nagi, which they do smoked eel. And this is my version of it, but it with mushrooms. Uh, certain steaks, doing wraps. So all this stuff I've been practicing for years and years. Doing pulled mushrooms so it looks like pulled pork or shredded chickens. And making super hearty, <coughs> sexy looking food. I could literally sit up here in front of a bunch of meat, meat eaters and just go through this and not tell them anything and they, we would, I think they would buy it until the end and then I could say, hey, you know, every single thing is my face. So again, the fried chicken is just a different setup. So I, here's me practicing all my photography because I feel like that one of the best ways to get it out there is through social media. The platforms out there now are really amazing. We have Instagram, Facebook, this and that. It's brought vegans to the surface, not hidden anymore. Again, it's more related, it's all food to me. I mean, it's, we do do fancier food. Chad tends to do a little bit more of the fancy stuff for coming from the SAF. You know, more, of the, more of the comfort style, like feed you, eat, me, feed, eat, eat as much as you possibly can. Because I work in the leadership team and I am the only one that I know of that's 
vegan, plant-based. So they have to consider that now. It is on the forefront. Like I said earlier, like these, I really respect these guys for, for making this move. Even if they aren't vegan, it, they're being influenced. And everybody has somebody they either their daughter is, their wife is, their girlfriend, their brother, sister, brother, somebody knows somebody that's vegan. And now we're here to like offer different options. When I came to this country, the only thing I could eat is a falafel wrap. Still, in most stores, is a fucking falafel wrap. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not that good. <laughs> that's the thing. So I literally stayed for 10 days in a hotel before I got my place. And that's what I had to eat. I mean, I had to stay next to beef eaters in the freaking premiere. And it was just like... So, I lost some weight. Um, which is fine with me. Uh, I, I, I don't mind inter intermittent fasting. If I need to, um, and then I got back into my kitchen, which is which is good. So I do have a kitchen, and I am cooking again. But the more aggravated I find that I get, the more opportunity I know there is. And so I understand that that anger, of frustration, of not having to, not being able to find something to eat, is translated into that's an opportunity where we can really change the system. And one thing I want to tell you guys, and if you could tell all your friends, it's, it's one thing for us to go in the store and be pissed off because they don't serve anything, but if we don't go to the managers and ask them for more options, we're not going to get them. I sit in meetings and they're like, why should we sell them? Nobody's asking for them. Dude, fuck. Like, seriously, we need to ask for them. If we don't ask for them, they're not going to put them on the shelves. It's a barrier, that's what they say. It's like, hey, if nobody's asking for them, why should we, why should we offer it? Because they're already making a lot of money on whatever they do have on the shelf. So they're taking a risk by putting anything new on the shelf. They're taking a risk on me, and like, I'm, this has to succeed. And I feel it's going to succeed, but it has to. Because we will launch a good thing. <laughs> um, so almost there. So, I'll touch the, I'll answer some questions if you guys have me in a minute, but um, this is my book plug. So in May, we got the UK publisher to print here at the same time, so it comes out here and the US, um, Wicked Healthy Cookbook, this May. Super excited. We've been making this book for two and a half years, and it's just going to be, it's 150 recipes, and it's like, tons of photos is everything I've ever wanted to have in a book, so I'm super excited. I've been correcting the final edits with my brother. He's in the States, we do all of the phone with the publishers, and uh, it's been a journey. It's an interesting uh, thing to have. This is one of my better pictures of Mildred. One of the last ones I got before I moved over here. So I moved over here in May, and I ha I've had to cancel every single trip home to see her. Um, we talk on the phone every week. <laughs> I've had to cancel every trip because it's such a, a busy uh, time for what's going on. I think we have a little bit of time, right? Ten minutes. But anybody have any questions we want? Despite, despite the fact that every second program on UK TV is about food and cooking food, yeah. and we sell a lot of cookbooks here, I'm, I'm convinced that maybe it's just a London thing, but not a, not a lot of us do actually
visual. It has to look good and it has to taste good. Once we can get there, right, we're not mainstream yet. I need to get, we need to get on, the, we need to get up there with everybody else. Because if they're serving, I can't, you know, I'm not going to knock anything. But it's, we just need to get on the stage. And that's where I want, that's where, what we're going to do. So we will get on stage and then we'll start making everything clean and as awesome as possible. What's your thought about how to, to bring that more compassion into it? Because I, I think that a lot of us would realize that people get very defensive if you bring yeah. that message at early stage. Yeah, and I've agreed, I agree with that. So, I, what's your view on how has that sort of come down for you at what point? Did the, uh, so, how I feel about things personally doesn't, well, I can't say they don't, it doesn't show up in a boardroom, but um, it's not a place. Like it's business, and that's how. Like I said, we I have to we have to get on stage right now. I'm trying to prove a point as far as getting there. And um, I have I know in my heart I'm like gosh, and that's what leads me. So everything I develop and work with people I work with, that's the leading factor as far as what I want to put in front of people. So I can just I don't know how else to explain that. It's it's only being in the room that can help. Yeah, they have a vegan menu, but 
they, they segregate. Like, I, we, should, we shouldn't be segregated. It, it needs to be in the mainstream, on the way, and not like, you are in the corner. 